Mr. Jim Walmsley. Welcome back to the podcast, buddy. How are you? Hey, good to be here. Um, glad to be back and uh, I'm doing good. How are you? Excellent. It's finally sunny here in Portland, Oregon. Are you at really? home in uh, Flagstaff? Yeah, I'm at home. Um, I actually haven't been outside today. Uh, I was on the indoor bike mostly, but I see some blue skies, but it was flurrying uh, earlier and we're getting a little bit of snow in the mountain. Always so, good. Always yeah. good. Well, awesome, man. Well, we've got a lot to talk about. I know there's been a lot of fun developments in your life and uh, some things that uh, you know are changing in real time. And so, you know, I'm sort of in the same boat myself, everything changing and shifting beneath my feet. And it's both exciting and terrifying. And maybe you can relate to that, but want to talk all about that and start with your recent uh, engagement. <clears throat> what an awesome, uh, awesome bit of news for you on the personal front. Tell the story yeah. about uh, how you popped the question to your longtime partner, Jess. Well, it's almost the stories of how it didn't happen essentially and eventually <laughs> did happen. But um, I mean, initially I was hoping to kind of start pick up like some uphill skiing and I remember she picked it up last winter and I ended up like running up some of the mornings with her up, uh, I think diamond peak and in incline village. And so we were out visiting her family kind of in the Tahoe area. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was just these epic days, beautiful view of Lake Tahoe and stuff. And we had this trip planned. So I, I was like, Oh man, th this is like the spot I'm going to do it there. Um, and it was like the beginning of the winter apocalypse out in Tahoe. I mean, <laughs> yeah. they just got feet and feet of snow. Um, we, we didn't, nothing was uphill open. So, um, that all kind of backfired a bit. And I, I carried around the ring for a couple of runs thinking like it could be it. And like, there's even a run where she went to give me a hug beforehand and she's like, what's that? And I'm like, Oh, we, we ran last night that I just accidentally left my headlight in my, my <laughs> pocket. And it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, um, but it ended up happening back here in Flagstaff. Uh, I think maybe my third time trying to Nordic ski and, um, it's a really pretty little area and flag up above 8,000 feet. So nice tree diversity. And I, I was still falling a lot in Nordic skiing at that point. So, so uh, hard. Nordic skiing is so hard. Yeah. It's been a learning curve. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So but what did you, did you, yeah. you know, kick the skis off and get down on one knee? <laughs> the people have to know how this all went down. Well, well she knows I'm, so I'm not the most comfortable person on snow. I mean, even running wise too. <laughs> and she could see, I was like awkwardly dragging out the, the, ski for a little longer i'm like oh no you got to come over here and then she sees me like unclipping from my binding and like i'm a bit of a klutz and she's just like no 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 she's like just stay standing i'm like oh man and yeah so i ended up getting kind of a non-traditional ring and a uh, little bisbee uh turquoise from really like south of tucson is where the turquoise is from and a local guy and jerome uh so actually both of those towns were founded by the same mining town, but kind of mm. built into these mountains, the really quirky little towns of Arizona. And, um, yeah, we just kind of had a, a special day, uh, out skiing and that's where it happened. How romantic, bro. How fun. Yeah. yeah. Eventually I should tell the whole story of how I proposed to, to Harmony here on the podcast because it's pretty hilarious <laughs> and, and it's similar in that we, I did it at the top of a mountain and it was actually Cone Peak down in Big Sur, but, and had it all sort of like planned out and had it in my pocket. And then we were, it was sort of a bushwhack ascent to the summit and Harmony was not enthused about the, <laughs> <laughs> the approach that I took up to the top of Cone Peak. And so of course we started arguing on the way up and I contemplated bailing until, you know, we had reconciled, uh, that particular argument, but ultimately had a, a beautiful romantic, yeah. uh, yeah. Proposal at the top of the peak and what a special time, man. Where are you, are you high on life? Are you guys feeling, mm -hmm. uh, pretty excited about this next chapter? Yeah, we're in a really good, uh, kind of just phase of life right now, enjoying it. Um, planning out like, uh, 
kind of the wedding and stuff. So uh, we're actually planning on getting married out in Silverton uh, kind of as a little bit of a goodbye to friends and family for a little while. Yeah. Well, let's talk all about that. Um, I don't think it's widely known yet, but as part of this really exciting next chapter of your lives, you guys are going to be relocating from Flagstaff, which has been home for a long time. So tell the people what's next. Yeah. So we're, we're not selling our place in flag. We're, we're going to try to balance the two, um, as best as possible, but, um, kind of a big pivot, uh, away from the U S trail running scene. Uh, I'm not going to be racing Western States this year. And in May this year, we're, we're aiming for kind of just arbitrary date of May 15th. Uh, we're going to be moving out to France. Um, and going to try to do about a year and a half. So I'd say two cycles of UTMB kind of through, um, yes. and I, I love I that guess, that's how you're thinking about it. <clears throat> two cycles of UTMB is how yeah. long I'm going to live in Europe. <laughs> it, it'll be a full training block, three and a half months, uh, before UTMB this year. Um, and then, uh, basically been trying to learn how to ski essentially, uh, Nordic ski and schemo to survive the winters in France as well. Cause, uh, it's a really great way, as we all know, the Europeans kind of stay in the mountains, they stay at higher elevation, they get a ton of vert. Um, and they, they use a lot of their gear that probably uh, a lot of Americans neglect to use, whether it's their jackets, their headlights, their packs, um, all of it's pretty applicable to big days in the mountains, whether it's over summer or in the winter. So I'm trying to pick up those sports a little bit and they've both had their frustrations. Yeah. Um, It's, it's so smart for you, I think. And one of the things that I like to say to people who are new to the sport or who maybe I want to sort of, uh, describe the difference between trail running cultures between the U S and the European scene is that in the U S ultra running was very much born out of running and you're very much born out of the traditional sort of running, uh, you know, history and that you were a highly talented high school athlete raced collegiately, et cetera. But in Europe, the sport is really born out of mountaineering. And so the best athletes in Europe are more outdoor mountain yeah. sport athletes. And as you're describing all the best athletes are spending time in the mountains 365 days a year. And that inherently means they're spending a lot of time on their skis. And so it sounds like you're intentionally as an uncoached person, who's always sort of been (laughs) self-directed in your training, sort of picking up on what uh, your European counterparts are doing in an effort to put yourself in a good position for UTMB. Am I right in that? Yeah, I think, um, it kind of, again, goes to where I need to improve in my own running background. I, yeah, I think the running part comes pretty natural, but the surviving over cold nights uh, tend to get to me and beat me up a bit. Um, so I think just full lean right into that um, is kind of what I'm looking to do. I mean, I don't feel like I'm very far off. I have some experience with it, but I, I don't think I'm as good as I need to be or should be um, where that's just kind of the biggest area of improvement I could do. Yeah. So, uh, that's what I'm going to kind of try to focus on. It's so funny, man, isn't it? Because everybody knows you're like the best of all time in the heat. And so, yeah, naturally it's the, it's the cold nights that actually put you in an uncomfortable position or maybe a vulnerable position. Um, and yeah, it's smart of you to make that intentional choice to you know, correct those potential vulnerabilities with this move to Europe. So talk about the, uh, the logistics of it all. I mean, how are you going to manage uh, a year and a half over there? Did you secure an athlete visa like Hillary Allen did? Or? Um, so basically that's what we're looking to do. Uh, I contacted the lady maybe in November last year and she basically said like full stop, you ha- you can only start applying three months before you plan on going. Mm. Um, so it's a lady, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, not familiar with, I, I don't know. It's something I'm about to revisit, 
um, uh, in the next couple of weeks, but, okay. um, basically, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You kind of have to provide enough, uh, evidence that you're top of your field in whatever you do. And it's a talent visa. It's not really an athlete specific okay. visa, but, mm -hmm. um, as long as you can prove that you're one of the best in the world at what you do, um, you can apply for this visa. And, uh, there's a lady in Seattle that helps kind of expedite and keep track of all of it that Hillary and Katie Scheid both used. Okay. Yeah. I'm, pre I'm pretty sure they both used the same person. Um, and so they've kind of, uh, pioneered the way a little bit and discovered this way of getting into France and it's uh, good for four years in France. And then you can reapply for it again at the end of that. Um, but so you're basically going into the application period now and you, you haven't yet secured it. Yeah, we're about to, um, I kind of look at it mindset wise of, uh, I'll go there for the whole training block and three TMB regardless. Um, and then kind of hopefully by then it's secured, uh, but hopefully it takes shorter and we have it before leaving. Yeah. But, um, Worst case scenario, hopefully before UTMB. Uh, and if not, um, we, we might be coming back to do a little trip and probably grab more suitcases uh, yeah. to go back to France. Does um, it feel like a scary yeah. leap for you guys? I mean, you've obviously been entrenched in the Flagstaff running community for a long time. I know your parents live not far away down in yeah. Phoenix. Does this feel like a really exciting new adventure? Is there anything about it that makes you a little uneasy? It, it feels like the right time to do it. Um, I, I would say things in Flagstaff aren't kind of exactly how they've always been. Like things are always changing. And mm -hmm. just with uh, my relationships with other athletes in town, it just kind of seems like a good time to try something new and freshen it up and just a little different environment. Um, I think Jess is a bit more intimidating and sometimes like I'll just go full blown into it. And she just kind of asks some more realistic questions of, uh, well, where are we going to That's live? important in a, in a married couple. You'll find that yeah. out. You'll find that she, out. She balances out the logic side of it. And, but then it very quickly jumps to my priority list of like, Oh, that's a good idea. We, we have to solve that of her problems or my problems. And, but she, she identifies good problems that we need to take care of first. So. Yeah. Well, shout out to Jess. Yeah. She seems to be a, a really great balancing influence for you. And yeah, as I said, you'll find that uh, it's very important to have those contrasting skill sets when you decide to share your life with somebody else and all good, healthy relationships have a little bit of that tension sometimes, but yeah. <laughs> have you guys figured out where you're going to land? Is it like Chamonix or Annecy or where in France are you looking at? Um, Ch Chamonix is usually a little too busy. It's not, yeah, you can't case. go anywhere in town, man. You've got the, the Killian situation where, well, the, the week of the race is like that for like all the athletes that get, uh, the attention. So the, a week before and a week after UTMB is insane. Other than that, it, it is fairly quiet in Chamonix, mm. but, um, I would say we're looking for more of a French experience. So actually being in, um, a nearby city, uh, is what we're looking at. And then it's kind of debating, um, what we can find. Uh, so like we search in the States on, you might look at Airbnb, VBRO. Um, I mean, that's not what they're using over there to list things. They don't have a Craigslist that they like, or Zillow or yeah. realtor.com. Like they, they don't use any of that. That's all American stuff. Uh, so they have the bone coin, uh, dot FR, um, which is kind of like a Craigslist thing that I, I go through, but the choices aren't always exactly where you want them to be. And then typically those are unfurnished. So at least for the beginning block, um, I'm looking a little bit at just a monthly Airbnb, um, because we can get the right location and just get it furnished and mm -hmm. kind of, I feel like have about four months to network to actually find like a year rental. Yeah. That seems like a somewhat smart way of going about it. Um, and then it's kind of a, a little bit how close, uh, Francois will let me move in. Um, <laughs> so 
So we're looking at the Beaufort area. Cool. Um, the other valley is Lake Contamine and then kind of uh, even coordinating some things with Hayden Hawks because he's mentioning wanting to move out potentially at the end of the year. Oh, uh, wow. So yeah, we, we Look might we're try losing to... our champions to the, to the French ultra scene. Well, I think he's oh, similar man. like me, like we like the running stuff, but, um, need to kind of probably improve in some other areas yeah. and I mean, it's, it's brilliant. And yeah. It's brilliant. I mean, for it's fun. I don't yeah, know. At the very Hayden, least it's fun. Yeah. And you and Hayden being at the level that you are, but also having the self-awareness to know where you need to improve, especially when you want to compete at a race like UTMB, which does challenge your skill set, even with how talented you are. I have to share a, a quick story um, from a conversation I had with Jess when we were at UTMB this <laughs> past year, because oh, I think it makes you so relatable. And that was she and I were talking about how you guys were sort of loosely planning on making this jump over to Europe temporarily. And she said something to the effect of, yeah, we just feel like it's kind of the right time right now. Jim, his contract ends, you know, at X time. And he just, you know, wants to do that now while he's still safe with his contract. And it just made my, you know, it just made me laugh hysterically because it made it evident that you struggle with the same thing. The rest of us athletes struggle with of just like, Oh yeah, my contract is ends at X date. And at that time I have no security. And for all of us, it's actually like a fairly stressful thing to carry around all the time. And for you, you know, one of the best of all time, it just made me laugh hysterically. And I think it may makes you relatable in that you're struggling with the same psychological things that us uh, mere mortals are as well. (laughs) Talk about that. I I still have no idea. Like, what I'm going to do when I grow up. Like, uh, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, the, the contract stuff, uh, they always have terminations on the end of them. Uh, they're going to end at some point. Everybody knows that. So, uh, there's a bit of stress of that. Like you're not going to do what you're doing. You're not going to be 20, 30 years old forever. Yeah. So, um, that looms over. I mean, I think we always hope there's another one. There, there's another good contract yeah. there. And something tells me you're going to be safe. To yeah. Something tells me you're going to be that safe. One. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? Well, hopefully that'd be yeah, really great for me. I, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, it, it's kind of good to have that sense of desperation or wanting to live up to the support that you're receiving. But yeah, I thought it was incredibly <clears throat> hilarious and relatable <laughs> when Jess shared that with me. Cause of course I was thinking, yeah, right. Like, of course, you know, when Jim's contract comes to its, it comes to its close, you know, there'll be no shortage of people wanting to resign him, including his, his current partners who he's been so loyal and committed to. So, well, another, uh, I mean, that's super exciting, man. I'm really excited to sort of see where you guys land. And I think it's really intelligent for you to make this move now in your career when you guys are, young when you're still in your prime and to really go after UTMB in the way that it sort of deserves to be uh, approached. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but another sort of exciting thing that's happened recently for you is you, you secured another ultra runner of the year award (laughs) five in a row. (laughs) Is it getting boring for you? At this point, I imagine like uh, getting no. I I just feel like I get ripped more and more online of like, oh, this international athlete, this international athlete, this internationally, <laughs> uh, like, and it's just I, people are always entering the sport. I I don't think so. A lot of times, just people don't know or don't understand or why isn't it an international voting thing? Um, and I think I recently listened to like your and Corinne's end of the year podcast thing. Um, but why, why there isn't, um, I, I think they could even keep like a top 10 North American, American sort of thing. I think that's good for a North American based magazine. Uh, I mean, it puts kind of excitement within their own community. Uh, however, a co like international top 10, where basically you get to see like, all right, out of the Americans that were top 10, which ones actually mixed it up like internationally too. Mm -hmm. um, would even give it some perspective. Uh, but, um, definitely trying to weigh the, 
I mean, Big's backyard, Harvey's big backyard. Yeah. Um, Nick Curry's 24 hours on the track um, with a 50K like Adam Peterman's yeah. to my road 100K to whatever's going on. Um, I mean, I think Killian's run back in Spain, which is about 100K, was a really phenomenal run this year. Um, yeah. Francois, obviously doing great things. Um, yeah. Internationally, I think it would take the right people to actually even, um, consider that full panel. But at the same time, I, I also think, uh, you'd have to have international voters as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm not sure there are many non North American voters on the panel. Yeah, no, that's, it's all North American voters for the, the Uroy panel. And then there's also all of Asia, which I think as Americans and Europeans, all of us struggle to break into following their ultra running uh, scene. All yeah. I know is it's deep, it's gnarly. I don't understand like which, like where someone's coming from and the Chinese runners like, uh, give me a fright of, I just feel like they have the gnarliest courses in the world and yeah. a- any one of them could come in and just crush a race and we've never heard of them. And it's yeah. just like sort of anonymous. It's almost like sometimes the Kenyans coming into half marathons or marathons and they're like 18 years old and yeah. they're the hero of their local village, but nobody's <laughs> ever heard of them. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, a spoiler alert, but it's definitely something that I'm thinking about. Maybe free trail would be in a good position to create a year end international trail runner of the year award, maybe with short distance and long distance. And my vision, something that I would be passionate about doing is making it, you know, voted on by the athletes, something Mm -hmm. that, uh, where we can all sort of share our respect for one another in a voting format, I would have to figure out the logistics yeah. of putting that together, but I, I mean, it, I it think needs our, to exist. It needs to exist. Our, so somebody has got to do it. Our sports may be one of the most unique sports in that for the most part, it's a pretty symbiotic relationship and positive relationship from mm-hmm. athlete to athlete. And I don't think we have many hard feelings within the entire sport, which is pretty insane. And, um, even with the current commentating, like you're a current elite athlete, like you and I go toe to toe, and you're out there at Western States commentating and being able to be on a stage and say positive things about things that like you run with those people and you, you know, their strengths. And you can actually like, when you're running with someone, you actually feel that person and you know, their strengths. And there's just like, this guy's really good or like yeah. just a beast, uh, in this way or that way. And you can talk about those things. So uh, I wanted um, to talk about this later, but we <clears throat> should totally riff on this because I think it's pretty special thing. And that's your relationship with Francois and in the recent long shorts documentary, I think they did a good job of <laughs> sort of illustrating the mutual respect that you guys have for one another and really just like a genuine friendship that you guys have for one another. And as you just described, it's a special thing where the two, you guys, two of the best of all time can have that type of relationship while still maintaining a competitive rivalry reflect on your guys's relationship. How did you guys meet and, and sort of what's that friendship like between you and Francois? Um, I guess we met maybe for the first time, uh, in UTMB in 2017 and basically had a found ourselves uh working together to beat up one of the other greatest of all times and kind of put killian on the ropes for maybe the first 70 miles uh but then i also found myself like with these juggernauts (laughs) i was the one that exploded of like oh no (laughs) like i so but that was my only utmb finish um coming after a dnf at western states and like to this day i've always done UTMB after Western States and I've only finished one of them every single time, but, um, neither here nor there, but, um, kind of maybe gain some interest in each other, uh, then, um, and then probably another really, there's a couple of other things, but, um, another really big one was Francois got into hard rock for 2019 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and, he still went out to Silverton to go train, even though the race got canceled. And I'm like, dude, I'm out here every year. Let's, let's link up. 
And uh, that was post Western States for me. So trying to recover, but I wasn't doing UTMB. He, he kind of talked me into like, um, we, we had stayed in touch and kind of talked me into trying to take a year off of UTMB to, to let some psych build about the race again. And, uh, so I went to Silverton, we banged out a monster week. Um, and it was kind of funny cause we didn't connect about it till months later and was just like, dude, I was on the brink of like breaking and like, that was such <laughs> a Neither one of you guys week. wanted to admit that you were, and then he was like, no, you were pushing it. And I was, I was hurting really bad and it was pretty funny. I mean, we're both at above 9,000 feet and just doing massive vert days and, um, doing little beer challenges up the avalanche shoot, uh, to kind of kick, kick off the end of the week. Um, and then what's another one. I think, uh, another one was when he was doing the, he had planned to do the FKT for just the PCT of Washington. Yep. And I didn't realize how just amazing of a section of trail that is. It's yeah. just awesome. And I remember it was kind of the beginning of my block for the world championships in Argentina. So again, in 2019 later, and, uh, I decided like, screw it, I'm going to go out there and pace him. And I didn't know what I was going to be getting myself into, um, kind of tracking it. Uh, dude, he was putting in like 80 mile days through a foot of snow. Uh, it, it, it wasn't possible. Yeah. And just, I, I'm at home just going, I'm going out there. I'm going to help. I, I like, this is crazy. I'm going to suffer like so bad, just trying to keep up like this is crazy. And I, I was initially thinking like, Oh, maybe I'll do like 10, 20 miles and try to do this and that. And then as it came closer, I'm like, no, I need to be all in. Like I'm, I'm going to run days with him or like, maybe I'll just run the whole second half with him. I have no idea what I'm going to end up doing. And then unfortunately, like the day that I showed up, I showed up at maybe 11 PM in there, man, these, French guys got this <laughs> RV together. It's him and his friends. And they just have these bottles of Safeway $9 wine. And they're just going to town like, wait, wait, what's going on? And they're like, ah, we threw in the towel. We're, we're, we quit. The, 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 <laughs> the weather's party. too bad. And they're, they're just like the funnest group. And they have these like hand games to play. And then someone's got to eat a spicy pickle of like, what's like, I, I'm pretty sure I lost that a couple of times and just refused to eat the pickle. Like, um, so that was a really cool experience to go up there, um, kind of do some camping running, uh, meet some of his friends that he, he does some big days and these guys are beasts. Yeah. Like they're not ultra trail runners per se. And, uh, they hop in for 40, 50 miles with Francois. Of, like that's a European I, I mean, mindset, isn't athletes. it? Athletes. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Um, yeah. yeah. So we've had a couple stories just kind of overlap in here and there and always kind of coming back together and reconnecting and, yeah. uh, what have you, what have you learned from him? Really nice. Because like, obviously like, you know, he, when he finished second to you at Western States, he was so classy and was nothing but deferential to your unique skill set to tackle that race, which you've displayed now three separate times. What have you learned from him? Because you got to pace him yeah. at hard rock this year. You got a front row yeah. seat to one of the greatest mountain hundred mile performances of all time. I loved in the long shorts video <laughs> and you, they included you, uh, talking to the GoPro talking trash to me, you know, well in arrears of, of Francois. <laughs> What Dude, was that I like? remember trying to go up Camp Bird Road and trying to peek. I'd see you sometimes, but then I'd like duck behind to make sure <laughs> you wouldn't see us. I'm like, no, no, stay closer to this side. Cause I was like not 60 miles into a race. I was a little more aware and he was just like, Oh, okay, we'll go to this side of the road. But, um, I I'm just continually amazed at how talented of a hiker he is. Yeah. Like, uh, honestly, it's one of his super skills because in, in the best way possible, because in my opinion, I think it keeps your heart rate down, your metabolism down, um, your, your sweat rate down, like all these things that are more maintainable. Um, and his ability to read when to run, when to hike, um, how to use the poles, how to use everything in his pack, um, his layering system to stay comfortable, um, he's just got it dialed. I mean, you look at pictures of Francois, 
his outfit hasn't changed in 10 years. In years. years. I, yeah. I think, I think 12 years ago, uh, he did him and Killian were into the white spandex. Thing. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I think basically, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, he's thrown shorts over that and that's about all that's changed. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. He's always got that, you know, form fitted <clears throat> thermal layer that he wears at mm-hmm. night with his pack over it. And then, you know, if he needs his jacket, he's got it and he's got the long shorts and the calf sleeves. And it's so true. And it's like super bomber brand. light too. Yeah. Um, he's got his headlight really dialed. And I think that comes in a lot from, uh, ski mountaineering. Um, I think Francois out of anyone, uh, in the world, as far as like top ultra trail stuff does big mountain days and really plays in the mountains, like more than Killian, more than me, more than other people. He is living and adventuring and surviving and exploring the mountains and um just kind of always trying to embrace that a bit i i would say it's more of a mental way of embracing things than it is um uh actually learning or copying this or that i think trying to figure out my own way of doing it but um yeah i because i still Um, think like there's a difference of I guess when I race Francois, sometimes I think about like if I could keep it a little more upbeat and make him jog when he doesn't want to jog, I can make him kind of maybe suffer race a little your, more. Yeah. Play your game rather than you playing his game. But it's also a negative for me too. Of like, well, you're still burning matches right now. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's interesting. I think we, we like that we're competitive, but at the same time, very different. Um, yeah. It makes it really fun to it's so cool. To compete yeah. So, against so each entertaining. Other. Right. And he does have that just like sense of calm. And his consistency is just mind blowing. How he just smooth. And, it, and he's just yeah. got those systems dialed so smooth, using the same equipment that he has been for 12 years. And uh the results just keep piling up and the trophies keep accumulating on his shelf, much like yourself. But yeah, I just think that your guys' relationship is a cool testament to the spirit of the sport at the highest level, two of the great champions being also genuinely good friends to the extent that you'll help them at hard rock six weeks before you guys do battle. Yeah. I feel bad that I'm not going to be back at, I I haven't missed Western States or hard rock in the last seven. I mean, even the races (laughs) haven't happened and I've been in Silverton every (laughs) hard rock week. Like, um, and there's, I mean, it, it really like even crossed my mind. Like I got to fly back for Western States and hard rock. And then it's just kind of shaking my head of like, you either got to commit to going commit. to Europe or, or don't. And yeah, I'm going to be missing it. And I, I'm going to be having to put the phone away and going on big training days to get my mind off of it. Cause especially hard rock this year. I mean, the only guy on the list that needs to be added to that is you, but, um, <laughs> it is, it is a monster men's field up front, um, which isn't always typical. Um, a lot of times it's draws one juggernaut and that's about it. And yeah, unfortunately, um, Aurelien Dinad Palaz who finished second to Francois at UTMB isn't, isn't going to make it. I mm. actually had a email exchange with him this week. He's expecting his <clears throat> first child hard oh, rock wow. week. So he's not going to wow. be able to make it. That's so, exciting. Yeah. It's, it's hey, good. For may, maybe he'll be back at UTMB. I think the UTMB list is. is, uh, extremely exciting. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think there's really talented guys uh, in that field. Um, I'll have to look over it again, but I know Tom Evans is hopping in it. Uh, Going to be kind of his back. first thing. You're uh, in. Luis Alberto's hopping in UTMB again for the first time in a long time. And yeah. uh, there's definitely more names that I'm like, actually, like, all right, there's no Killian, there's no Francois. There might not even be a Xavier, but um, mm-hmm. with his health issues, but it it, it's not any more confidence inspiring walking into that one so i I think it's going to be a really exciting year yeah no doubt as it always is 
So I guess let's uh, back up a little bit and just at least talk briefly about Western States where, of course, you were able to secure the three-peat in another just absolutely incredible performance, winning by 80 minutes and one of the hardest days ever. Of those three victories that you have at Western States, I mean, I'm sure they're all super special, but it seemed to me like that one was a special one, especially given the fact that you were somewhat compromised in your training buildup in the months ahead of Western States. And of course, coming off the canceled year with COVID, what was it like to secure that three-peat and how did the three of those victories rank against each other? Um, They're all really unique. They're all really unique buildups. They're all really unique how they kind of went down, even though the outcome's somewhat similar, but um, Honestly, nothing will ever beat 2018. Uh, after kind of feeling like I just was almost even giving up as far as aspirations was just like, look, I just want to go run. Um, I, I could care less what's happening. I'm just gonna, I'm tired of throwing it out there. Like I, I've just gotten torn up by this race. I need to just go do it. Um, and then having a super breakthrough. And I don't think 2000, I think 2018, was actually pretty similar conditions and stuff to this last year. Uh, Mm. both really, really hot years. 2019, I think was things clicked, um, had Jared on my heels. That was really fun. We did a lot of training together for that one. So that was pretty special. And then just to have a bit of a cooler day. I mean, the times across the board were just ripped fast and I don't see how anybody touches that time. Of course it's it's recency bias. Yeah. So, Killian's Killian's run when he won was actually cooler than 2019. Wow. And then Timothy he ran like 1536 or something like that. Yeah. Like <laughs> more than an hour slower than you. Yeah. He had a good year though. Yep. <laughs> Statistically. Um, I don't, I wasn't there for the actual legitimate conditions though. Cause yeah. something that isn't, easy to go back at the books and really check too is, uh, snow conditions in the high country. That's a lot harder, harder to study than just the hard, the, the temperatures, but you can look at snow routes. You can look at the, the water level. Um, all of that stuff, Western States is pretty meticulous at, so it takes a lot of subjectivity and context to put a picture together. Um, but Timothy Olson's year was also another, and Ellie Greenwood's year, another 10 degrees cooler, than even 2019. So like the freak days happen and basically you got to keep showing up. You got to keep being ready. And then and when the weather, <laughs> when the weather happens, I mean, someone's, someone's going to roll it and then, and then they got a race, but on a hot year, I, I mean, I still think 15 hours is the mark to be of like, uh, if, if you're breaking 15 hours on any given year, um, you're, you're putting yourself in contention. Insane place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very rarely do you go under 15 and not win. So how did your lead up to the race maybe change your psychology about training in general? I know now you're doing some schemo stuff, you're doing some <clears throat> Nordic stuff and you were pretty open before Western States about the fact that you were dealing with a knee issue. I think it was, and you were spending a lot of time on the trainer. In fact, you kind of secured a partnership with Wahoo as a result (laughs) and it, and it paid off. And obviously you've always been known as sort of a high volume run only type guy. And it now seems almost mirroring some of the um, (laughs) training strategies of the European athletes we've talked about. You're diversifying your training skill set. Was, is that sort of born out of this, training build up to Western States where you're somewhat, I mean, injured? I, I don't find I have the same energy I had five years ago. Really? Um, yeah. In a lot of ways, like I look at training block after training block after training block that I, I mean, 2016 was insane. I, I raced a bunch. I mean, it was a fun time and it was awesome. And I got to kind of compete a lot more as a dark horse and do more of the local air viper races and just show up and nobody is expecting anything and just like feel like i just nailed it and it could be a padunk race and i just like served a world-class performance at it and didn't even know what i was doing that that was a lot of fun um 
I would say there's two things with that. Sometimes I, I kind of question if I, if I feel as uh, much energy as I used to have, or um, also with it is the pressure of showing up to races and expecting a certain level of performance out of myself. And really, I think it goes to professionalizing it to make sure that at the big races, you bring your, your best a game and, so, so there's a little bit of a step back to some patience and not over racing and missing your opportunity at the big race, but you've been kind of lighting it up all year. Um, I think eventually like there's a certain point where you need to just focus on the important races, let the other one slide and build your career that way. And I think that's kind of how my, especially, I mean, you look at, I did four races this last year. Um, three out of four went really great. Uh, I, I just really struggled again with the turnaround from Western States to UTMB. I think they're just very different ends of the spectrum race. So, you, I mean, I just even go from Western States, sauna, Phoenix, Grand Canyon to just freezing my butt off in Colorado and just not being able to stay warm after doing so much heat training. Um, the heat training is a bit interesting because mm. I also think it, it's a bit interesting in that, um, I didn't do heat training in 2020 during COVID year. And when I went to Colorado, I didn't feel as good as I usually do at super high elevation. So for super high altitude blocks, um, I kind of like the thought of doing heat training than high altitude that there's the blood volume thing with the heat, yeah, but, yeah. um, I, well, they I think always I say that heat training is like, that. is like the poor man's altitude. Yeah. Training, right? That's fascinating <clears throat> that it feels like almost the heat training makes you worse in the cold going from Western States to UTMB too. I, I think so. I mean, I lived a couple years in Montana. Um, it gets cold there, but I did fine with it. I wasn't training at a high level while I was up there, but I was still training a bit and I was getting outside a lot and just, I mean, I remember running a half marathon in like a t-shirt gloves and some half tights and it was maybe thir- t- around 10 degrees and just like, that's what people do in Montana. It's just not a big deal. And I wasn't doing summer vacations anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as diversifying sports and stuff, I mean, I was still doing a bit of so I would say 11 weeks out from Western States, I made a call to back off on my IT band and basically that I could take three weeks and basically I dedicated three weeks to the indoor trainer. Mm-hmm. Um, so the bike and I just started biking and I was like, look, I'm going to stay fit on the bike. And then eight weeks to go, I got to make something happen in eight weeks hit. And I'm like, my knee's still killing me. Like, yeah. what do I do? And just kind of by chance, I realized when I was going really steep up, really steep down, didn't notice it. It was the and so for me, stuff. Yeah. I would have about two miles from my house to some of the steep trails and then two miles back. And generally I would feel it on my way out and when I'm finishing, but once I get to the hills or mountains, I could go up, I could go down, up, down, up, down. And even the Grand Canyon, like six to 750 feet per mile may, might not steep enough. I was trying to keep it probably over a thousand feet per mile. Oh, that's um, steep. Pre- that's pretty steep. steep. So that's I mean, not I like fix- Western States training, not typical. Um, um, so I actually thought it was going to transfer really well to UTMB. Um, but for other reasons, I don't think it did, but, um, probably only two weeks out, I finally started getting good feelings with the IT band. I wasn't even sure, um, two weeks out, like before it started kind of finally going away that, um, cause I just tried to avoid hurting it. So if I could do it, I would do it. If I felt it, I, I would stop. Um, and so I did almost zero flat training. And then with two weeks ago, I felt confident enough to throw in, maybe one workout on flat and then was like, all right, it's good. And then, uh, so just went in to, you, to Western States with uh, a lot of vertical up, down and really difficult runs and routes that like 
people don't link up here in Flagstaff, which is kind of funny. Did it change your mindset about how to train at all and moving away from the 140 to 160 mile weeks yeah. and, and maybe doing shorter blocks? Yeah. So I guess I, I got up to a hundred and I want to say my block was 120 miles. So significantly less than what I've done for Western States before, but yeah, um, essentially it gave me some confidence that I've got a base of training of years now, um, that I haven't had in my life. And that right now there's more than one way to train for a race and especially giving me more confidence that I can get in really good fitness on the bike. I think I've done really good training on a bicycle several times in my career now. And, um, that's giving me some confidence to, especially now, like, um, the biggest reason why I'm doing Nordic skiing. Well, I guess there's a couple things that play for this year, but, um, the first thing, uh, I'm just trying to avoid racing. So essentially after Cape town, one of my goals, so Cape town was end of November. One of my goals was just get back into shape. And so I started running relatively early and basically things started clicking and I'm like, Oh man. And I started oh, looking no. at too early. black can black Canyon. I'm like, I should do black Canyon. And just like, for what reason? And just, I couldn't really justify it other than like being a bully on the local course. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and, and like, I'm just like, that sounds so awesome. But then it goes, take a deep breath, big picture. What's this year about? It's about UTMB. UTMB. Yeah. What does black Canyon have in common with UTMB? And it's like, not a damn nothing. Thing. Yeah. I mean, it's long, but right. not, not much. Um, I do think in general, there's my two cents qu real quickly about black and it runs way harder than on paper. Um, um, it's very undulating. So I, I do think people should do more vert than they give it credit for. Uh, but nonetheless, not important. Um, so basically January comes around and I just decided to pull a plug on like training that was going pretty good. I just pulled it and like, I'm not going to run like in January. We're just going to see how this goes. And wow. we, we started getting snow and I had gotten a schema set up. And then in Tahoe, um, we couldn't really, we, we weren't properly prepared for just getting dumped on fetus snow. And we just had our uphill set up. So uh, Jess was like, let's go to the Nordic center. Oh my gosh. Nordic skiing is it's brutal. <laughs> Dude, I've, I haven't been sore from an ultra as much as I was from, <laughs> I did like two hours on the Nordic skis and just, yeah. And then jokingly, when I proposed to her, uh, she's like, Oh, you you had to learn how to ski before you could ask me to marry you. But, yeah, um, you know, there's a great tradition in our sport too, of Nordic skiers being awesome trail ultra runners with Courtney DeWalter and Rory Bozio and Xavier Thevenard. And I mean, Ben True is an incredible I mean, Scott Jurek and Dusty Scott Olson. Jurek. Their, yes. their book back in the day starts with them in high school, Nordic Bro, skiing. That's super mature of you though. I think, you know, as you talk about not feeling like you have the same energy you did in 2016 when you were in your mid twenties, now you, here you are in your early thirties to have that self-awareness and to voluntarily pull the plug on training that feels like it's going really well and keeping that big picture in mind. Is that a decision you think you would have made in your no, mid twenties? Not at all. I would have done it for sure. Look at but, you. You're um, engaged. You're actually resting. You're diversifying your training. This is a new job. Well, I mean, I was on the bike a few hours this morning, but, um, I'm still <laughs> training. I feel really good. I feel well-rounded. I feel really healthy. Mm -hmm. So I feel like everything I'm in a good spot. Um, but one of the ideas is just trying to open the season later. Um, I think the skiing really, that's one of the biggest advantages I think the Europeans have over the Americans is by the time the end of August, basically September rolls around, they might have one, two races in their legs. And for the most part, the Americans are showing up with a season in their legs. Tired. Yeah. And, um, so I'm really looking at, trying to open up in April, um, instead of the usual January, February and just drag dragging on another cycle and this and that. And even doing Cape town at the end of the year kind of, I think helped me relax a bit with, 
I got an end of the year race in and let's just the body remembers that it wasn't that long yeah. ago. Yeah. It's Slow funny. Roll. Cause I I've like barely been running, but I've gotten in a couple of decent runs recently and actually like finally got a good like tempo in or just like did a local route <laughs> where I just kind of pushed all the climbs. It's like, I actually feel pretty good. Like not that yeah. far off. And then it's like, well, I did just suffer through a 27 hour hundred miler, like whatever it yeah, was yeah. two months ago and three months ago, the body, the body remembers not to, yeah. not to mention the 12 years of self abuse I've put myself through in the lifetime of yeah. uh, athletic pursuits. But that's awesome, man. I'm so happy to hear that. And I think, you know, you've got all the talent in the world and with this sort of like intentional mature approach, that's what it's going to take for the Americans to finally achieve success on the UTMB course. So let's actually talk about UTMB a bit from this past year you and I ran together a little bit on the Italian side in the days leading up to the race. And it was sort of clear that you were somewhat compromised. You had a thing going on with your foot. You had to like tie your shoes in a weird way. Um, and you know, one of the things that stood out after the race, of course, after the Americans had another disappointing showing, Tim Tolson said something to the effect of that he didn't have the courage to not start. I wondered if you had heard that. And if that, that uh, resonated with you at all? Like if you looking back at how it went, do you kind of regret that you stood on that start line knowing? No, not at all. Um, I've regretted not putting my hat in the ring at UTMB when I haven't. Um, I think it's a really big career goal and I'd rather lose the race or it not go well then not try. I, I don't know. Um, for me, I, I didn't see a reason not to do it. I, I thought I had a good enough block, um, kind of hit some decent training. It, at least some of the volume was there. I thought I really banked on trying to do a bit more freshness over fitness. And I think the two UTMBs before that, I had some of the best training blocks I've ever done and just kind of the tiredness shows in my UTMB race. And then this year, I think I was a little bit, maybe even on the other side of like, could have been a little more fit. Um, but just, no, I, I don't know. I think, uh, given one day earlier, one day later, I, I think my own feelings in the race would have been different. Um, but unfortunately like kind of get going and I mean, even 15, 20 miles in, I, so 2018 was a bad experience at UTMB. Like my legs fell apart after 20 miles, like really and that's bad. after you broke the course record at Western States and then went to yeah. Silverton and started doing 150 mile weeks in the San Juans. Like you, I say that's you the fittest I've flat. ever been. Yeah, yeah. It's the fittest I've ever been in my life. And it paid off absolutely 0% at yep. UTMB. Um, and I was, I just remember even to this day, like vividly how bad my legs felt going through like Contamine. 19 miles into the race. I'm like, Oh boy, this is going to be a tough race. Like, let's go, but let's like, this is going to be tough, but let's go, like, let's go get it. And then like, I leave the Valley and just, Oh no, like this is really bad. <laughs> like, um, mm. and it wasn't that bad this year, but I knew things weren't clicking. Like <clears throat> I usually for an ultra, like I can do the preparation and everything. And at least the legs are feeling good. And like, just be patient, no problem. And you'll build, 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 and it'll be okay. It still just didn't feel completely right at UTMB. And I would say I gave it 40 miles of hanging out, hanging out, hanging out, waiting for it to turn a corner, turn a corner. And then just, um, it was actually dropping into Cormier halfway. I, I mean, I mentioned we ran past, um, someone that Francois and I both know and like, how's it going? I'm like, actually it sucks. Like I'm just, not having a great time. And then, um, you're running in the lead with Francois at this time. So yeah, it's, it's a, an amazing a day for you. It's still day. a dream um, for me. <laughs> and even Francois was like, Oh, I mean, I, I feel pretty tired. Like, I think we're both similar situation, but I told him like just before the A station, like I got to try to take some calories in and take some time. And then it's amazing when you get in there in the middle of the night and just how much false, readings you get because of all the energy of seeing people. And there's like basically a six hour block from like Contamine to Cormier and then Cormier to Champé-Lac and that middle place in Cormier, like 
you go from no bottom analysis. of the pit to like, dude, yeah. we got this, like, let's go. And, and basically I just, I didn't slow down enough. I didn't eat enough. Um, and I need to regroup more there if it was going to be possible. And basically I left going like this game on and I actually caught Francois twice on the climb out. Um, one time I think, cause he made some wrong turns out of the city. And so I caught him pretty Come quick. on, bro. <laughs> you yeah. this thing three times. <laughs> you should know your way. Um, and then I stopped to go to the bathroom cause we ran past some port. They need to put some porta potties that are accessible to runners in Cormier. <laughs> I go through there every single time going, I need to go to the bathroom. I've never seen a bathroom. And basically like I always leave and like, I need to go somewhere. And we ran past the porta potty. I'm like, I'm using it. So did that and then caught back up, but just hit the lowest of lows as we're going up one of the steepest climbs of the race. And, um, I, I was just tired of waiting for it to turn the corner and, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I called Jess, uh, <laughs> in the middle of the race. And I'm just like, I, I think I'm going to turn around and go back to Cormier. And she's yeah. just like, I'm, I'm not, I left, I'm not picking you up. And then I get super pissed, hang up. She's like, keep going. And then I hang up and then, uh, I call back again. I'm like, it's not coming back. Like I I'm, I'm not even walking well at this point. And basically she's like, keep going. You're doing great. Blah, blah. Like just this and that. And <laughs> super pissed, hung up. And she, basically in retrospect, I'm like, I probably never want a crew to ever pick me up at an aid station. Actually, I think it was amazing. And your, it's not your crew's job to pick you up and take you home. It's your crew's job to get you to the finish line. So in retrospect, I think it was amazing. Um, however, I started, what? Not the bad guy. No, Jess is not a <laughs> bad guy, but yeah. in at that moment, she was the bad guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think she did absolutely the best thing for me and wanted me to finish and keep going and keep fighting. But, um, I was just broken and, yeah. Um, nonetheless, that's when I pulled over the side of the trail and I started putting on all of the clothes in my pack. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is going to be a while. And like all the top guys are passing me and they're just like, Oh, uh, do you need help? I'm like, I'm just getting my jackets out, man. <laughs> and I'm like, and I remember reading like Orleans, like right up. And, he's yeah. like, and then I passed Jim and he was done. <laughs> and I'm like, man, why'd you have to say it? Like, or however he worded it. And it was like, he was so right. <laughs> so uh, what, yeah. what's it like though? I mean, for you, I think one of the things that listeners would love to hear about is just like, you know, dealing with that failure, you know, especially when the lights are on you, you know, that's something that... <clears throat> nobody who listens to this podcast will be able to relate with is like being at UTMB in Chamonix and having to wear a mask through town so that people don't recognize you, everybody expecting you to have the best race ever and to have to drop out. Yeah. What's, what's that like? I mean, do you have situations where you're just like, God, I am freaking unworthy of this attention. Like this is embarrassing. Well, like, the first like unworthy part is I've only raced UTMB with bib number one. Like next time <laughs> if, just, if they give me bib number one, I'm flipping it upside down. Like, yeah. <laughs> or if they just give me draw 13. like a three next to it. So you're number 13. <laughs> no, I'm going to, because I think in cycling, if they think the bad number is bad luck, or if they think the number is bad luck, usually 13 oh, really? only they'll flip it upside that. down. Oh, that's cool. Um, and it's technically, I think for 13, it's allowed. I, I don't think other numbers it's common, but at this point, number one is bad luck for me. And, um, so yeah, it sucks. Uh, it's definitely a huge low. Um, I mean, it is what it is. It's, I, I just generally let it be dry and not try to add much onto it. I don't go out and try to make excuses about what or this or that happened or what could have gone better. Um, for Which I really part, admire I, about you too, Jim. And I think it's worth saying because I don't think you were like telling people that your foot was beat up before the race. And after the race, you weren't making excuses about it or anything like that. So, I mean, I, I do respect that, that approach that you take. Well, I, I, I think, yeah, if you're lining up, you're lining up where the, where it is, like in the other side of it, if 
I, I don't want to hear about someone else's injury going in the race. Like, Oh, sure. But also, um, just because you have something going on doesn't mean you can't overcome it. And, and also I'm not going to show those cards to other people before the race. Like, <laughs> um, that's my business. But, um, <laughs> in a lot of ways, I think finishing the year at ultra trail Cape town and going back to more of maybe a style of a race that suits my strengths pretty well was kind of a decision for me because I didn't have a race on at the end of the calendar after UTMB for the most part, I generally don't put a race on the calendar after UTMB just because I don't know how I'm going to bounce back from that. But, um, I mean, it probably took one week before I decided I'm going to do something of just, uh, I, I didn't want to feel like I, I nailed it. I felt like I nailed it at Hoka project carbon X two nailed it at Western States dropped the ball at UTMB and just like was going to leave it there. Um, <clears throat> more than anything, I think I kind of did one more race for my own sanity and yeah. almost as a, a, and especially like maybe something that I consider more in my realm of strength Your uh, real house. as a, as a little bit of a nice thing for yeah. me to do. Confidence for me booster. And, yeah. And, well, thanks for talking about it, man. Cause I, I think it is important to humanize people like you and understand that like, man, even though you've won Western States three times and you drop out at UTMB and I'm sure you, you know, most people are supportive, but somebody at your level with the public persona that you have, I'm sure you get inundated with, you know, at least some sort of hate about, you know, not putting it together again. And of course the Americans have the reputation. It's always dropping the ball at UTMB. So I, one thing I wanted to ask you about also is the UTMB Western States double. And if you think that's dead from now on, like really there's, there's almost nobody who's put it together. Well, like Killian won both in 2011, yeah, yeah. both Seth Swanson and Tim Olson have put together solid runs. David, at Laney. Both. David Laney too. Thank you. But this year, it was absolute carnage for those who ran Western States and tried to do the double at UTMB. What do you, what do you think about that double? Do you think that's the last time we'll see the top professionals in our sport try and tag both of them in the same summer? Well, definitely not the last time to try. Yeah. Uh, I think I saw Tim Tolson sign up for both again. Um, <laughs> Good but, for them. Um, I think people should keep trying. I think, uh, you can have good success at both, whether you can win both. Um, I'm sure. Yeah. I, I would say our sport has a lot of growth to go through yeah. still. And I think someone, I, I, especially in the States, I think there could be a lot more done on mentorship from younger talent and younger ages. And that could change everything. Um, with, with basically after five years of like getting the right role models, helping you develop and do this and you just let them go. And then I, I think that could turn into something that um, will take the sport to faster, newer levels for sure, yeah. like pretty easily. Or um, <clears throat> I mean, the, the top East African guys is such uh, fascinating interest but at the same time like how do the can like say it starts blizzarding and utmb in the middle of the night with your headlight like how many times has la kipchoge done that during yeah. his training run like a different ball game. Right, it's so, a whole different sport yeah but just like you or me like we're constantly trying to improve in those situations like no i don't want to go training every night in a blizzard with a headlight on and three jackets and two pairs of tights just to stay warm however occasionally I find myself in that situation. Like, yeah. So there, yeah, it's a learnable sport, but, um, skills and I think are sometimes underestimated. And I mean, if you look at Europe for the most part, like there, I think it's latitude, but, um, they're as high as like Montana and, mm -hmm. or Canada. And like, they're getting real winters compared to what most of us are getting in the States. And so when it gets colder and harder weather, um, I, I think that it's harder for most generally speaking Americans to transfer over. Um, but I think you also see maybe 
very big similarities between Americans, Australians, South Africans, as far as warm weather runnable. Um, and then yeah. again, uh, the, the, how the sport's developing in Asia. I mean, again, uh, it's in mostly Chinese or even Japanese has their own culture and stuff. Um, and a lot over there is all developing on, on its own in a different pattern yeah. and how that's going to cross over eventually. Like there, there's going to be a first Chinese winner of UTMB and yeah. very soon, like some of those guys are knocking on the door. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating, man. Well, dude, it's so fun to sort of talk through all this stuff with you and I appreciate you being so open about it. And I think we can kind of start winding down. I'd love to sort of hear what's up next for you. You mentioned that you might race in April as you build up for mm. UTMB. Of course, you've got a wedding to attend to yeah. at some point after that. And then you're going to be moving to Europe. What does 2022 look like for you? Um, yeah. So some people have kind of announced their calendars and I think it's kind of funny to, I mean, I think Pow had 13 races on his <laughs> of calendar. <course> he did. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm back. Love that. Um, love that. Yeah. But you pulled it off for a few it's, years. Though. It's so hard to show up for all of those races. Mm. Um, I find I start with a pretty bare bones schedule and I'll fill it in as I see fit. Um, and basically that starts with April 23rd and UTMB. Like for sure, I would say those are the two places I'm racing. April 23rd. I'd love to do, um, so if the last two years have taught me anything, make a backup plan. Uh, so basically option a, um, is Madeira Island. I think it suits the right style that I'm trying to improve on. Um, plus seems badass and fun and yeah, we'll check it out. Um, hopefully. And then backup plan would actually be probably canyons as kind of a domestic option on the same day. So regardless, I'll throw together the training block with that date in mind. Um, and then, so April 23rd, getting married early May, moving May, middle of May, find myself in France somewhere. Um, and then I would it's, love to, it's full uh, steam ahead towards UTMB. Yeah. I know. I mean, one thing about announcing your schedule, then like all of a sudden, like guys like me see pow on the start line of a uh, lava raid. I'm like, Ooh, that, that could be fun. <laughs> but I, I don't know. Um, I think other people have not been completely satisfied also with a lava raid or, um, UTMB, UTMB double. double. I mean, I, I think Francoise, double, uh, is a bit of an outlier. Um, if anything, I think they're similar, but I mean, just for the most part, doubles aren't happening to go into UTMB. I, I think he pulled it off, but I wouldn't bank on it in your schedule. I mean, that's going down in history. I don't see yeah. anybody else ever doing that again. A hard I rock think, UTMB. I think Court, isn't Courtney signed up for, uh, or she's, well, she could pull got it off. Western States hard rock, right. Which are even closer. Oh my gosh. But she could get into UTMB technically if she wants. I'm not sure if she signed up or not. I'd have to double check. Well, but, it's really um, only those yeah generational defining athletes that can pull those types of things off, like Francois and they Courtney. They come along. Yeah, yeah, they come along. So yeah, but, why not um, try? Yeah, it's exciting. So I, I would say I'm not sure. I would say it depends on the stress of the whole process. May is going to be a very fun busy, stressful time and, um, could be worth stress wise its own race month. Uh, so I'm not sure I'll throw a race in between. Um, there's a slight chance of maybe trying to do a short, like golden trail race, um, as well, I think would be a good option, but that would be sweet. But those guys well, like, and are in something. their own bubble. And, no, uh, that's like August 7th. ish. Usually. Marathon. I mean, that would be good. If June, July, I, there's not a lot like in Western States week, July, I think. Yeah. Around there. Um, July would probably be better. Yeah. Um, but you do the Iger I, trail. I, I don't know. 
Yeah. Well, bro. Yeah. And you no need to make any decisions now. I think the Madeira UTMB combination would be amazing. I was actually thinking about going to Madeira also. So you should. maybe you'll be able to kick my ass out there. No, no. We'll get the poles out. And we'll bust use, the poles use out. Use the headlights and like, dude, why is your headlight so much brighter we'll than mine? We'll work on our like, systems. We'll try and be like I Francois. Just, yeah. yeah. I just swapped it for lithium batteries. They're way brighter. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Maybe uh, one more question before I let you go. I just had Camille on the podcast and she was talking about how she wants to keep doing some of the road and track stuff while she feels like she still has her speed. Of course, she's 40 now. You're still only in your early 30s, but I know you've said something similar of like wanting to tackle comrades in the 100K world record while you feel like you still have that type of speed in your legs and some relative youth. What are you thinking about on that front? Is there anything on the road or track or like, you know, world record realm that's speaking to you? No, it's on the back burner. Um, between, I would say, 50 mile 100K attempt in 2019, the marathon trials, the half marathon was a lot of fun. Um, the one I did before, because I initially hit 104.00 to like qualify for the trials, which was just like, yeah, what a, yeah, interesting. But then I actually did another half marathon a month before the trials where I ran, I went through the finish line in 102.15 and everybody's like, something's off. And uh, essentially they, in a little out and back section, they didn't put a cone out as far short, uh, as they yeah. needed to and it was 285 meters short actually. But so I think it's about a 63. So it'd be fun. To, the half marathon seems to be a fun distance to not take a ton of concentration and get a lot of benefit out of. Um, and then more than that, I find I get tired of showing up to roads and wheeling out my own cones and not having it. I, I think it's a hard routine to attack road racing and not having a team structure for it uh is difficult and i think that's why you see teams based for marathon stuff i I think it's just a really hard training regiment um and having a team to show up and do workouts with i think is really important but as far as ultra road stuff uh the 100k kind of checked a lot of boxes for me and kind of that desire i I thought Mm -hmm. i got a lot out of myself in that race. Um, so right now I I would say I'm going to go all in towards the UTMB direction. And if there's a growing desire, that's what it's going to take. There's a growing desire to go back to the roads. I'm, I I think I can do that, but right now, um, it's not part of the plan to do any road ultra track, ultra timed ultra, um, sort of thing. I I find I'm happiest and taking my life towards France and big mountains and Chamonix area, I think, uh, makes me pretty happy right now. So I'm I'm just going to follow that passion. I think, I think in general, it's really important to make goals that fire you up and, and give you a lot of drive to to train hard because that's what it takes. Um, at, at almost any sport. And I think even sometimes coming in from track road, you think like, Oh, I'm not going to have to train as hard. These guys are all super slow. But sometimes you think about it like, well, Western States, I wouldn't be surprised if my heart rates averaged at over 160 for 14 hours. Yeah. Like it, it's a hard day. Um, it's not maxed out, but at the same time, like it's hard to sustain it. Um, it might not be that high, but yeah, well, I was just curious. Yeah. I was just curious yeah. because like, I just view you as this anomaly who has the skills obviously to win Western States three times, but who could also win comrades at hundred K world record and win UTMB. There's just not a lot of people like you. And so I think, I think people would be wow. interested. I mean, but it's, I, I it's think it's a bit you're, unfortunate with comrades and, uh, I no, the real unfortunate tragedy is like we had a global pandemic that mm-hmm. has affected all of our lives and stuff. But one of the byproducts is comrades hasn't ran in the last two years and South Africa alone has been hit really hard and yeah, lots yeah. of other areas of the country or world. Um, it, it's been a tough time for, for most people. So, um, yeah, but races are happening races. I mean, those things keep us distracted from real life problems and they're, they're a heck of a lot of fun to spend our time doing. No doubt, man. 
Well, Jim, thanks so much for your time, dude. It's always great to just sit down and chat about the sport with you. I appreciate all the sort of knowledge and insights that you provided. Congratulations on the recent engagement. I'd love to see you this sort of renewed, mature, engaged, uh, you know, 30 in your thirties now. And, uh, just, yeah, just turned 32, uh, this month. So happy birthday. Yeah. Bro. yeah. yeah. Thanks man. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah. Happy birthday. Congratulations. Good luck with the move. Say hello to Jess for me and, uh, we'll talk again soon. Hey, sounds great. Great catching up.